uh, smart, you know, I really got on with him, he was very clever, sort of, you know, sharp boy, and um, you could have a conversation with him, and I think, you know, he was, he was John's eyes and ears a lot of the time, you know, he introduced me, uh, John Lydon to a lot, of, a lot of music, like Peter Hamill and stuff like that, I think, you know, I was down at, to Grey, because he'd go out and he'd, John Gray would go and buy a lot of uh, different sort of music, and was into a, a you know, very adventurous, um, thoughtful kind of musical taste, you know. Not exactly up my street, you know, uh, but a big Kane fan, for instance, and all that stuff, you know. So, uh, I, was, I, was really, I was really into Philly, was another big thing I was into, you know. So when Sid turned up, is it, he's like more of a Bowie type of point, I guess. I mean, yeah, very much so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was really into that. He wasn't really into football. And it was really weird. I did a BBC, a radio documentary on him because I was actually, I saw so much shit spoken about him over the years. Well, just. <laughs> This kind of icon stuff where people would talk about him as a kind of caricature. And actually, it was very interesting that when he'd come, one of my oldest mates, I didn't, this is typical of London, I didn't even know when he'd come back to London from my beef with his mum. Because he was, first of all, I think he was born in the West End, or so he lived in the West End, see. He went to primary school near Piccadilly Circus. And I think he was living in Covent Garden. That was when Covent Garden was still a pretty dilapidated market area. It was always a bit of a slummy area, actually, at the time of Hogarth, even, and, and all that, you know, uh, uh, that, that, you know, around there was quite, you know, seven dials and all that. It wasn't upmarket thing. And uh, they were living there, and then I think they went to move, they moved to somewhere like Tunbridge Wells, um, and uh, they went to Ibiza, and then I think Tunbridge Wells and Bristol, and then back to London. Anyway, whatever. My mate Terry Penton, um, when he was about 15, he put him up because Sid had been kicked out by his mum and Terry put him up. Um, you know, looked after him. So I didn't know that for years. I talked about Terry for a long I didn't even know. Him, you know. And I ended up doing a documentary and found out a lot about it. It was interesting, like going back. I met Sid when I'm like 16 or something. And it was interesting finding out, like a movie, what, what had happened with him in the two years or so before he met me. You know? Yeah. And it just, I, I didn't realise just how much he'd been taken under the wing. Terry had looked after him, and also um, a bloke called Billy Dolan, and another bloke called Vince Bracken. So he ended up kind of coming back to London, living in Hackney, Queensbridge Road. So he goes to a local comprehensive school, it's pretty rough, and he's having a hard time. And they, yeah, they're good blokes. They looked after him, you know, and, um, and they looked after him and made sure he was kind of all right. And, he, and they, even then, they would tell you how he was ziggy, he was dressed like. Uh, Ziggy Stardust, mm. he would be really completely all the makeup and everything, really, which a lot of people were. I mean, Bowie was a really big news at that time. You, know? so you must have looked quite an odd combination of characters. Yeah, yeah, I was just, you know, working class looking youth, you know. Um, but you're all completely different. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then the punk thing started, and everyone used to go to a hairdresser's called Smile to get their hair shaved and have to get together ten times to go and rate. You could have gone up the local barber. Done really, but just blow the smile with nice bridge. Just the fucking number one, right? You know. And um, although I must admit, there's number ones and number ones. You've got good ones, you know. You've got to do it properly. As the Turkish ones do a good job, in my estimation, you know. Um, and they're dark blue and all that. So we started doing that. And I, and I really knew people that I knew, like the girl I was with at the time. She was very trendy, and she was going up. Um, to King's Road and going in what was called sex in the other carriage shop. So I already knew a little bit about that. So did you go to sex shop? 75? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So what was that? Because I'd creep about. I mean, I, I, I was going up around, you know, I'd, I'd go to soul clubs and mm -hmm. make Ronnie, we'd knock about and I'd go down there. All the girls used to go to Beavers mm -hmm. and they'd rob it blind because I think they didn't have any security. So every girl in there weren't shoplifters. It's like, it's so easy, you know, so. Mm -hmm. They'd have all the makeup away, and I mean, they had lovely clothes, but it was really sexy, chic, sort of, you know, the girls, you know. And I'd go to second hand stores, and I still do. 20 quid for the suit, it was two pairs of trousers. Oh, yeah. Suit, yeah. Quid, yeah. In Oxfam yeah. and Grammar. Yeah, so yeah. I don't, Very I, good. It's one thing, I, I'm, a, I'm a spendthrift, but mm -hmm. I don't like spending top money on, you know, so yeah. I play the percentage game, you just go in until you get something that fits or can be all with bosh. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, no, yeah. so I still do, so I've got second hand places, I've always done that, you know. So, so when the punk thing started emerging, how much 
of a park it were you you just kind of obviously you were in there but were you kind of like this suspicious of it or were you kind of really into it well no i, I was um getting a bit bored with king's way right, you know they ended up kind of getting out of here and um so the punk thing i was intrigued in when john come back one day and he disappeared for a couple of days and i said where you been he said i've been abandoned and I said, what? Because at that time, working class kids wouldn't be in bands. It was that era, that horrible era you had because the music had been grabbed by the middle classes as it is periodically, you know. And it was all about being, they were all like total, utter wankers, a lot of them. Long hair, uninteresting, playing that pompous, ridiculous kind of rock with loads of solos, no groove, you know. There was exceptions, but generally speaking. Like, I like Gone, funny enough. From that time, all gone, Steve Village, and actually I've worked with him, he's a good producer, you know, he's kind of for real. Gone is still really good. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. Really a good producer, I've played him a couple of times. He could be a proper producer. But anyway, um, so working class kids would tend to sort of wouldn't learn a guitar or an instrument. That was beyond them, you know, it's, it, the middle, it's always, we're always close as we're doing now, in my estimation, to going back into the 19th century. Where middle class, where it's the, it's the preserve of the middle classes to play an instrument the way they would have learned in shallow or learned to speak French. <laughs> you know, the overseers of the post industrial revolution that lived in big houses in Wiventon or wherever the fuck area, you know, in those massive houses. And they would learn French and, you know, learn to play the shallow, that was for, for you. And the underclass go and drink gin and fuck off and, <laughs> and, and watch football or something, you know. Um, you know. So, um, and that was the vibe. So for him to say that was a, was a bit like, so I said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm learning to fly a 747. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so it was quite intriguing. What was his attitude to being in a band? I mean, it, is it like he's going to run off and be, do it properly, is it? Because he kind of think it's quite funny being in a band, or was he quite serious about it? I think it? he was a bit nervy. I think he was very excited, because we were all, we weren't conformists, mm. and we all wanted to have fun. You know, I wanted all I wanted was I wanted to have fun. You want you want at that age, I think mean, you want lots of sex, and you want uh, and you want to have nice clothes, and you want to, what you don't want is dull routine. Well, people like me, you know, maverick kind of figures. You know, um, you didn't, you wasn't thinking of kind of the way other people probably quite rightly at that age thinking of career path or something or some logical progression. It's just all I wanted was my immediate need satisfied, which is a, probably a lot of psychotherapists would tell you it's quite unhealthy. Unfortunately, at 55, I'm still like that. <laughs> so I'm nice dinner, you know, a bit of the other. You know, you know, sorry, giving too much information. I still, I still want what I fucking want when I fucking want it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Good day for now. Yeah, yeah, but at least I know I'm very selfish, so I do actively kind of try and do stuff for other people. It makes me fruit pretty tea for me. <laughs> so, when, so John's in the band and... Yeah. So did you go and see him pretty early on? Yeah, early on. And um, it was great because he was just one of his mates about, I suppose, to create that, make him feel secure and sort of ambience. And of course, we, to us, it was just... I remember talking to Vince about this fairly recently. And we, we for us, we sometimes did too much. It's all made of it. For, for, to us, just... It was like this thing that was really good fun. But it's kind of, it started in 75, really, this first kind of, that for precursor to it. And then, and 75 was a very interesting year, actually, you know, and there was good clubs in London, and, you know. And then, by the summer of 76, it's really going. And so it really started in the, maybe, sort of, you know, spring of that year, really. And by 77, it was already getting a bit, you know, a lot of yobby kind of blokes, a lot, it became a bit of a bloke scene, you know, and it was all a bit dark and boozy and people fighting and it wasn't, you know, so it, 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 at its peak it was just about nine or ten months really, but very intense, very, very intense and I'd never knock it because if it hadn't have happened I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now, John, you know, no way, you know, and I'm still part of that generation, I've still got that kind of, that kind of personality that's a bit self, self-centred, not really a very narcissistic personality as far as I'm concerned, to be honest, you know. At least when you know it, you can kind of work with it, you know, um, a bit, you know. But I'm still kind of impulsive, I'm still very fiercely independent. 
I can't be waiting for corporations to get their act in gear, like, fuck off, you're still doing yourself, you know. Um, so I still release my own records and just make things happen as, in your own way, you know. Which is very much the best part of the punk experience, I guess. Exactly, yeah. So, so when John joined the, the Pistols, Sid was obviously not happy about this, was he? Because I, I, I was read this, but he, he kind of thought he'd be the obvious one that they would have chosen. I just think, yeah, I mean, it's understandable if your mate gets in something. Well, he's I, the obvious I, one. I, I could really identify with that. That's always yeah. been that beat, you know. It was by a gig, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, so, yeah, I think he, he was... It was all that type of that true that it was Vivian Westwood thought that was the job she wanted or something, mm. I don't know. But I mean, he's the obvious choice for rock stars. He doesn't well, I don't know. I think, I think to be honest, you know, John really had something about him. He did, but not the conventional way. You're really thinking out the box to choose him to be the singer, which was a stroke of genius. Well, I don't know. For me, he was the most charismatic person I've ever met at that point, to be honest. So he's really charismatic. Bit of an awkward fuck up, even then, you know. I mean, you know, but um, he was very charismatic. You know, and, and he, he really was something that people were drawn towards. Like some people would be, you know, like, <coughs> bit slightly, um, it kind of couldn't quite work him out. But, but enough people would be kind of drawn to him. And he really had that. I don't think anyone else could have been Johnny Rotten. Mm. You know, really, you know, he had that thing on stage of that. He looked fantastic for a while. For a little while there, he was just looked absolutely superb, you know. He'd wear his clothes really well. And he had that real kind of manic intensity on stage that Sid wouldn't have been able to do. Mm. But Sid, in his own way, is a really interesting character, great humour, mm. and just an interesting sort of character. And a bit lost. I mean, that was the thing in the documentary. I did feel a real part of making the doc when I'm making that radio documentary about Sid was because I kind of felt, God, I feel quite empty towards Sid, and I shouldn't, because mm. I did not bad a fair yeah. bit. And, but why do I feel so empty? And when I kind of investigated it. I was able to feel some compassion, you know, especially when via John Savage, the, the, the writer who did him in the of course, he, got, he very, very generously gave me access to his archives. And, uh, and he actually had a recording of Sid's mum talking about Sid. And she didn't even know. John said, oh, he went to Kingsway. Ah, oh, people fucking say, no, I don't fucking know. I don't know. I think she was in Derbyshire or somewhere like that. She wasn't yeah. a Londoner to start with. And, um, she was kind of saying, you know, no, I, no, he never, I would have known if he had, so, and he fucking did, because I went there with him, yeah. you know? so she didn't even know, and there was a thing on there with her saying, I fucking kicked him out, and he said, but mum, he's at 15, where would I go, I don't fucking care, sleep on a park bench for all I care, mm -hmm. so it's very sort of damage, she had a drug problem, of course, as, yeah. as well, you know, um, so it's, you know, it wasn't, and God bless her, I mean, it's not, you know, every, no one chooses, people are impelled by their karma, Think really in these situations, you know, sure, free will ultimately doesn't come into it. That. Yeah. It does in terms of changing how you behave in this moment and seeing that that then influences the next moment. Clearly, seeing having some view on that, but it's very difficult to do that when your thinking is very clouded for whatever reasons. So you have to have compassion for people, you know. But, so I think he was, he was, he was, of course, he was upset when John got the gig, but still, he had enough about him to get lashings of attention. From all, from everybody, you know. So yeah. yeah. Was it was it kind of shocking for you the way he kind of went? You know, he became suspicious, picked up his persona, which is not really him, is it? He wasn't. He wasn't a fighter, was he? No, he wasn't really. You know, I mean, he did. He did. He was. I mean, Terry would say. He, I don't remember him. I remember him. Sort of. He would put his hands up, and Terry remembers him. He would fight back at people, but he'd get kind of bashed. But he said he was quite game. Mm. Um, and he did with Terry once, I mean he went to Terry, Terry stabbed him in the neck at a party with a meat fork um, in the neck, I think. Obviously not fatal, you know, or anything, and, and in self-defence as I understand it, you know, and, and all that, but, you know, Terry, and I don't think their relationship was quite the same after that, so, you know, um, but, um, but he, 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 had that, he had that junky kind of thing, what I would call the junky thing, very dark, very hopeless, and he would talk then of death, of wanting to die young. And it is a kind of a dark thing that happened. He, he was going to see a psychiatrist, like a counsellor, every week, because they were obviously concerned with him. They knew, you know, he needed help. And I don't remember really focusing on that, and a lot of the people I knew were kind of wayward, um, so it wasn't something that kind of, wasn't a big deal. 
and he asked me to accompany him to see his psychiatrist, his counsellor guy that he was seeing. Oh, well, that's not, sorry, the counsellor guy had asked Sid to bring me because he said, who, who'd you hang about with? Who's your, who's, your, who's your best friend at the moment or whatever? And it was me. And he wanted me to go because Sid had told him he wanted to kill himself. So it's all a bit in jest, but actually many a true word said in jest. So this guy's rightly very concerned that Sid, aged 18 or something, says he wants to kill himself. So Sid invites me to go, and at that point he was still John, John Beverly, you know. So I go to see the, uh, this, this, this shrimp with him sitting here, and he said, John, you know your friend John, he says to me, you know, says he has nothing to live for and wants to kill himself, and you're his friend, and I want you to tell him that that's not true. And I said, ooh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> we were both really dead, man. It was, it was horrible, really. And I, and, I, and I said, well, to be honest, I'm sitting more from his point of view. I don't, I don't think he has. <laughs> He's got no money, and I think he might be happier, and I think the world might be happier. You know? <laughs> and Sid and so Sid was going to him. <laughs> and he got, quite, and he actually got quite indignant. I remember him going on about movies. You've got movies, and there's so many interesting things. He said, "Go and see a movie," and he's on board. And it was at that point really playing up to it. Left this bloke very frustrated. He was very angry with me and the whole situation. You know, so. Yeah. yeah, we come out, and we were fantastic. We were so deadpan because we just totally straight faces. And when we got out, we were laughing. He said, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so during the pub period, what, what were you doing that, you know, before, obviously, the, the public image line up? Oh, you, well, you kind of hang around with John and... No, I'm not. Um, before Peel started, um, so, seven, as I say, 76, hot summer, I come up here for the first time, actually, in Manchester. And my first memory in Manchester is in a fucking heat wave. Can you believe that? It weren't raining. But now I live here, I know fucking the wettest place on earth, you know. Um, anyway, so it was really hot, and then I was doing that. I did all manner of jobs, you know. Um, I remember working on the building site. I, I was told to dig an hole, be careful, there was a pipe. I burst a fucking pipe, but it got sacked, you know. I mean, any other. Um, and I, I was asked, people asked me to be in bands, I didn't take it seriously. I'd knock around that scene, the squats. Were you actually playing anything at this point? Did you pick up the bass? I started saying in 77, I was in a squat because I'd left, I'd left home young, you know, um, because my old man said, right, give me, give us 20 pound a week, I'll sling your rook, which is, you know, fair enough. You don't want to play the game, go and get an education, fuck off, mm. which is fair enough, really. Um, and I did, so, and I ended up, in a few places, I up in a squat in a borough in South London. I got hold of a bass, cheap music man copy, really high action, had an amp and a lead, sold the amp and the lead to get a bit of beer money. Mm. Just met the geezer here somewhere from Jesus and Mary chain. That geezer, I ain't seen him since I sold him my bass. He took advantage <laughs> of a struggling alcoholic looking for beer money, but he, no, he bought me, duck joking. And he bought my bass off me, so I thought the, when I finally got a good bass, I sold it to that geezer. But anyway, this cheap music man copy, and um, I'd lean it against the headboard of the bed. Didn't have legs on the bed because we'd chopped it up to burn it. Um, we'd chopped the furniture up, put it in the fire. It was freezing fucking cold, you know, and upset the people I shared the squad with, to be honest. But anyway, I was in the end left alone there, and I'd hold it against the bed instead, and you know. And, and play, and because it was such an awkward action, it actually taught me, it was like a really good way to play. A lot of players you find from poor backgrounds learn that kind of way. The elastic band, the Hassan, the guitarist I was playing with yesterday in Morocco, would just made a one string instrument because he was so, you know, that's how, more. And, he, and, and his, he said every week his brother used to break it, which is horrible. <laughs> and in the end, his big brother felt sorry for him and said, yeah, I bought him a guitar. You know. okay. Anyway, so that was it. So, but you didn't learn conventionally, did you? Because I remember you telling me the way you write bass lines, you write them in shapes. I mean, shapes, yeah, yeah. because I started to, I, start, I got a book on how to learn to play bass, to read the music, and the first one in the book was American Patrol by Glenn Miller. And I quite like Glenn Miller, actually, believe it or not, but I thought, oh, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to learn that. I thought I'd bollocks, which was probably a good decision. 
And I just thought, right, okay, here you go, four strings. Here you go, I'm trying to put some kind of, make some sense of this instrument. I don't know anything about music at all, really. So it was a visual thing. Like this four strings, I like the feeling of it, the deep bass. I like the open E string, I like the open strings. It feels very satisfying. And here's the dots. And so I made shapes, I made lines, I just made, I played geometrically. And by so doing, I didn't know for a very long time, but I was playing modes, medieval modes, if you like, you know. This sort of music that is, you know, everything in medieval, which tended to be very fixed cosmology, fixed notes, very fixed forms, you know. Um, and I am a medieval kind of a guy, I'm very fixed, you know. The idea of my mind, it tends to be fixed, you know. Um, and that's how I played. Yeah, yeah like, you play a triangle, you go there to there to there. Uh, yeah, I play yeah. Uh, an octave, so you've got an octave there. Um, so pop tones, if I had a bass I could show you, you know, it's like, it, it's like a triangle, but it's like, you know, you're, 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 you're a lovely shape, um, octave, octave, mm -hmm. and then back again, and then you've got you know, the another octave with a little chromatic thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's just very symmetrical shape on the bass. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it. So I mean, to answer your question, yeah, it was getting 77, I don't know, I must have been 18, I think, uh, something like that, 18 years of age, and, uh, and going into 78, and nothing much going on. I had to get out of the squat, doing various jobs, not happy, and really at a point where I'm a neat, not in education, employment, or training, you know, I'm, you know and I uh, end up, uh, you know, I end up back home for Christmas, they let me back in, because we got kicked out of the squat, you know. Somehow, council took it back or something, and whatever. And we ended up, uh, I ended up back home. And the two weeks turned into a couple of months, they were really getting like getting fed up with me again. And, uh, and I got a phone call from John. I saw, I went down to Wally's, the local shop, which had a big picture of Bobby Moore um, in West Ham, a way strip on the wall. I went down to get a paper, and that's on the daily where I saw the pistols had split. Yeah. Oh, and I think I went back home and I got a call off John. I know, a little while later, he said, do you want to be in a band? Mm -hmm. you play bass, and that was that, that's how public image started. He said, Keith's over here. So I met Keith. And, Did you know Keith from before, like, the scene? Yeah, um, yeah, I've met him at, um, I think he says I met him at, because we lived in Edmonton, my mate Ronnie, my oldest, I used to knock about with all the time then, he was uh, supposed to marry a girl out of Edmonton, and they had a house over there ready for him to move into. He never actually married her. I moved in, and then John moved in, Johnny Ryden. I think he had to get out of his house, you know, um, with his mum and dad, like years, you know, 76, 77 or what, because although he was in the pistols, he, he wasn't getting any money. Yeah. So he ended up over there, because he said, I need a place. So I said, well, mate's got a gap to come, and so he stayed over there with us, and um, yeah, we stayed in Edmonton. And uh, so we were there for a while. You know, various sort of places, and, and, and anyway, Keith said I met him there, but I'm pretty sure I met him before that at the squat in Maybell. You know, I'm not sure of that, you know, that's what I'd be playing Sid's bass, you know. What was your relationship with Keith like <coughs> at that time? Has he, has he always been the same? He was always friendly, he was always a friendly guy, you know. Um, to me, you know, he's friendly, and we got on, and just, you know, like, I found an interesting character. He was a bit different to the other people there. I realise now he was well educated. Um, you know, at that time, you were, if you were public school educated, you were probably best off to kind of hide it a bit to merge in. Now, they just ruled the world again, like the lying furries. In that time, you know, you kind of hide it a bit, you know. And um, I think he was very educated, very, you know, very, uh, I think he went to the, I think he went to the same school as the Dimbleby brothers and all that, Keith, you know. And his real name's Julian, you know. <laughs> um, you know. Um, but it, it, they're, they're fantastic public school boys and girls are reinventing themselves. And they're really very bright, they're educated, they know how to adapt and all that. And, um, and, and, he, and he used, obviously he'd been, he obviously, was a, was a kid who'd been well educated musically, although he'd never say that because it wasn't punk, right? Yeah. So he didn't say that. But he, but he had a flair for music and, a, and an idea for music and had some good taste and some good taste as well. And so we just hit it off because I was coming with this very instinctive approach and he had this quite cerebral approach.
crunch of my leather, you know. And it was just basically, I mean, as my mate, somebody else put it the other week, like a month of them talking about this, it was, the, these are these three oddballs you've got kind of knocking around London at that time, Johnny Lydon, me, Keith, you know, forms a band and, you know, it just kind of works. Yeah, know? it's three very different characters, but somehow yeah. it really fits together perfectly. Different, yeah, very well, yeah. Two, two albums. Two albums, yeah. yeah. I mean, was there any kind of master plan what the sound was going to be? Or was you just basically just start playing it? I had a very together? fixed idea, um, which I've still got, which when I played bass, I fancied the job. You know, I, I, I would go and I went, the best gig I ever went to see, I went to see Bob Marley at the Lyceum in 75. He was doing um, Natty Dread, you know, but he had freaks. And uh, it was fantastic. It, to this day, it's the best concert I've ever seen by a country mile. It was incredible. And I watched Aston Fanny Man Barrett playing bass, you know, it was oh, the power coming from the bass. And I used to see groups like the Simmerons, there was there was Afro rock bands, there was a lot of South African musicians in London at that time because of the apartheid system. So I started seeing these bands with great bass players and that's your real education. You just get in the feel for the instrument, you know, and I just was already going to blues dances with Brian. So we go down in the blues dances, very, and that was something we were doing very young before, before I'd even met Sir John. I think even we'd pop in, we'd go in the blues thing, me and Ron, and uh, and that was the bass would be, whoa, you know, that really heavy duty, you know, to what men was stuff, which really developed more and more through through the seventies, you know. Um, so I had all that going on. So I was bringing that for me. Bass was a visceral thing. It was a physical thing as much as I was just interested in getting it as low as possible, you know. And it was like an emanation. And so I was very instinctive, and, and I just fancied the job. I could do lines. I can still groove. But one day I'll probably lose that. But I can really hit a groove, you know. The only other thing I did that I can remember that was similar to that, for just being at ease with it, was um, play pigeon shooting. <laughs> and I was uh, with him you know, years ago, you know, now, and I was with him missus and we went and played, but it was like, I'm in Scotland, so you do daft tourists, and you go fishing, do things you never normally do, you know, and went, um, uh, and went, and went and clay pigeon shooting, and said, yeah, I've never done it before, and the bloke got the album with me, because he said, why'd you say, why'd you say you haven't done it before you have, and I said, mate, I haven't, but I was just, <laughs> even the rabbit ones, I was doing rabbit ones along the ground, and I was just, you know, yeah. Just had an idea for it. Also, when I played golf, I was pretty good, at it, which really scared me because I know loads of golf tossers. And yet again, you get involved in something, you're never going to get, you're never going to reach perfection with it. So, you know, I, yeah. I put in jumpers and you talk about bogeys and birdies mm -hmm. and fuck that. So, I got afraid. In the way that I did with heroin, when I took heroin once, um, we would get up the West End with a few of my pals. And of course, the sneaky daily like, geezer, yeah, I'll match myself, and there's something, you know. And I had some snorting it, we did, and, it, and they were all spewing up, and I was just sitting there. And I remember just sitting there, and he said, You've done this before, haven't you? And I, <laughs> no, and I was just thinking, Don't even talk to me, I don't really want you, because I'm just very happy, and I thought, Fucking hell, this is it, this is H. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Just don't do it again, stick with the booze and stick with, with powders. So that was the same with play pigeon shooting and golf. Especially play pigeon shooting. So that's shooting. your skills then, yeah? That was what I was just naturally really good at. I was a bad footballer, but I think that was something you learn, you learn over 